continue with our Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we are asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We are asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and she are Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall every one eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. Chapter 8 
Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shalal Ashbaz. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Meher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly, and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for the signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves, and curse their king and their God, and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish. And they shall be driven to darkness. You have just listened to the Bible reading. And we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray.
Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will bless your coming. The sacrifice will not be in vain. And all our new people, those who are coming for the first time, I pray that God will give you the spirit of understanding. And the word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us together for the love you have given us for your word. We pray that our coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Impact our lives. Help us, Lord, to take everything you are teaching us to personalize everything and to live by the word through your grace in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. You can do better than that. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're continuing in our study of First Corinthians. We have read, we have studied chapter 1. We are now in chapter 2. And tonight we are looking at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verse 9, all through, all through to verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. I'll start by reading just verses 9 and 10, and then the last verse, verse 16. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Then in verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. As we look at the verses before us, we'll see that the apostle is revealing something very deep and very high, very great, that everyone on earth ought to know. In particular, members of the body of Christ, children of God, ought to know this because it tells us these are great revelations. Actually, it's a mystery. What had not been revealed to generations past, but now revealed unto us. And it says we can even have the very mind of Christ. We can have the spirit of Christ. We can have the life of Christ. We can have the character of Christ. As we look at the verses tonight, we're dealing with God's unsearchable inexhaustible riches for kingdom citizens. There are kingdom citizens. Number one, that's the kingdom. And it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is king of kings and he, and he is lord of lords. When we say kingdom, that means the realm and the arena where Christ reigns. A king reigns in a kingdom. The territory of that uh, place where the king is and the realm in which he is, where he has dominion, that is the kingdom and the subject and the people and those who have come into that territory. They have come into that kingdom and he rules over them. He rules in their heart. He rules in their character. He rules in their behavior. He rules in everything concerning them and they put Christ on the throne of their heart. Those are the citizens of the kingdom. Now, as we know the kingdom citizens, then we also know the riches of the kingdom the riches of the king what christ has provided on the cross of calvary what he makes available for you what he makes available for me the provisions that he gives the promises that he gives the grace that he gives and the gifts that he gives those at the riches and they are 
unsearchable and they are inexhaustible and they are so great that it occupies and it compasses everyone the small and the great the newcomers and the old timers the leaders and the members he has a portion for everyone and they're so broad they are unlimited that's why we refer to them as unsearchable that's why we refer to them as inexhaustible and that the riches of the kingdom or the citizens of the kingdom and they're coming from god they're coming up from above this world it's not just what we what we see here in the world or what we possess here in the world but what comes from god himself the creator of the heavens and the earth what comes from god himself the owner the possessor of heaven and earth and then with love and then with mercy and then with grace without any limitation and without any restriction he gives all these to us that's a summary of what we're looking at tonight god's inexhaustible unsearchable riches for kingdom citizens we divided the message to three parts number one the revelation of god's provision for believers the people we refer to as kingdom citizens they're actually believers they're the people that believe they believe there is god and they believe that he will diligently reward the people that seek after him and they know that he has sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him as savior as their substitute as their sin bearer whosoever believes in him accepts him and receives him as savior will be saved and will not perish those are the believers and god reveals what he provides for them point number one the revelation of god's provision for believers point number two the realization of god's plenitude by the beloved the beloved that's the lord jesus christ his only begotten son his only beloved son and he sent him to die for us and to give us what we will need here at the beginning of the christian journey and all through our christian journey and onto the climax the culmination and the finality of that journey he provides everything we will need and we refer to that as the plenitude the word plenitude means the fullness the completeness of all we need and he has provided that by the lord jesus christ the beloved one the realization of god's plenitude by the beloved number three what's our response having known the provision of god having known the fullness of what christ has provided for us on the cross of calvary what's going to be your response because your response my response matters a lot it provides salvation what's my response it provides holiness what's my re response it provides sanctification what's my response it provides power the power to overcome what's my response it provides solution for every problem what's my response it provides heaven even for everyone and what's my response point number three the response response of God's people to his benevolence is so benevolent is so merciful is so open-handed and open-hearted and he provides everything for us but he's waiting for his people the response of God's people to his benevolence let's come to point number one point number one you have the revelation of god's provision for believers we're looking at first corinthians chapter two verses nine and ten it says in verse nine but as it is written i has not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for them that love him understand that he has provided quite a lot he has prepared quite a lot for the people that love him look at verse 10 but god has revealed them unto us by his spirit 
For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. As you look at those two verses I've read to you, it says, as it is written. It's referring back to something that had been written. Where? In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. There were many things written in the Old Covenant for the New Covenant people. Written in the past for the people coming in the future. And we are the people, we are the beneficiaries, and we are the people to come today and look at all those things that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, of the things that God has provided, has prepared for those that love him. And let's see where that quotation is coming from because it says it is written. As it is written, we're coming to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64. And we're reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 64. And we're reading here from verse 4. So you will understand where the apostle is taking that from. It is written. What eyes have not seen. What ears have not heard. And what has not entered into the heart of any man. What God has provided and what God has prepared for the people that love him. Isaiah chapter 64, reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 4 here, it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eyes seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for him that waited for him waited for him. He's talking about people that know that everything they can get in life, there is still something more. Whatever they have achieved, there is something more. Whatever physical sin, whatever natural sin, whatever personal sin, whatever professional sin, whatever educational sin, whatever the world has provided for them, there is still more. And that sin that is more is coming from God and because of that they are waiting. They know he loves them and they know they love him and because of that they are waiting and he said eyes have not seen and ears have not heard it's not entered into the heart of man the things that have been prepared for them that wait for him in the new testament it says by the spirit them that love him let me look at three things here as we look at the revelation of god's provision for believers, actually four things. Number one, the previously unseen preparation of the Lord. The previously unseen, unknown, unidentified, undiscerned, undiscernible things that God had provided. Look at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 16, here the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to his own disciples, the believers, those who have come unto him, and they were fortunate to have and to see what others have not seen. It says in Matthew chapter 13, reading verse 16, but blessed are your eyes for the sea and your ears for the hear. Look at this, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and uh, righteous men have desired to see the things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear of those things that ye hear and have not heard them. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his own disciples. He said, the fulfillment of the word of Isaiah has come upon you because your eyes can see what the prophets of old could not see and your ears have heard what the saints of old could not hear. But blessed are your ears and blessed are your eyes because they have seen. Let's look at verse 35. In verse 35, it tells us that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will alter the things which have been kept secret. They have been kept secret from the foundation 
of the world, that means from the time of Adam and then to the time of Abraham and to the time of Moses and to the time of those Old Testament, Old Covenant people, what they have not heard and what they have not seen, Christ said, I will open my mouth and I will declare unto you and that's what the lord is telling us in uh, that first corinthians uh, chapter 2 let's come to first peter chapter 1 first peter chapter 1 we're looking at verse 10 in the old testament those prophets prophesied that these great things will come unsearchable things inexhaustible things things that they had not known in the old covenant and now they were finding out first peter chapter one looking at it in verse 10 how these things will be and when these things will come and it says in first peter chapter one verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify when he testified before beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow the sufferings of christ and the provision that will follow the sufferings of christ and the salvation that will follow the sufferings of christ and the grace and the gifts and the possibilities that will follow and then it were told in verse 12 unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves not unto themselves, not unto the prophets of the Old Testament, not unto the people of the Old Testament, and not unto those pilgrims and patriarchs of the Old Testament, that those things were prophesied, but the fulfillment was waiting for you and me, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us the they the, the ministered the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. They were so great and they were so mighty and they were so uh, magnanimous that even the angels wanted to look into those things those are the previously unseen preparations of the lord for you and for me let's come back now to first corinthians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 9 in verse 9 it says but as it is written i has not seen no ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god as prepared for them that love him the things which god has prepared for them that love him in the passages i've read to you already those people of the old testament did not see them did not know them they were searching when that thing will come and they were searching who were the people that will receive the doses i come to number two now the presently unsearchable provision in his love at the present time where we are now in the church age at this time at this dispensation in the new covenant that he brings to us now the presently unsearchable provision in his love uh, that word unsearchable follow me to ephesians in ephesians chapter 3 we're looking at verses 8 and 9 ephesians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 the things that are provided now the things you can have now the things that our hand of faith can be stretched out and we can receive from the lord ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? The unsearchable riches of Christ. 
Those who are the six that he said that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and is not entered into the heart of man, the things that God has at this time, in this dispensation, in this new covenant, in this generation, what he has not provided for the people that love him and the people that believe in him. He called them the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all men see what is the uh, fellowship of his mystery which from the beginning of the world has been look at this has been hid in god kept in god and the people of the old covenant they did not know this who created all things by jesus christ as we analyze those things the things that the old covenant people have not seen the things that the old people, old covenant people have not experienced and they have not been partakers of. But now we come to the new covenant and we're partakers of them. How can we describe them? Let me show you just a few of them. Second Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, the promises, the provisions, the grace and all the possibilities that he has provided for you and for me today in second peter chapter one look at verse three according as his divine power has given unto us all things those in the old covenant did not have that all things those people even those who prophesied in the old testament they were still searching you know, when will that be when will it come upon the people in the world when will these great possibilities these extensive possibilities these unlimited possibilities and these unsearchable gifts of god and grace of god when will it come the inexhaustible power of god in the life of man when will it come it had not come unto them but look at this now in this verse it says according as his divine power he has given unto us he has given unto us how many things there church tell me how many things there all things that pertain unto life and godliness all things that pertain unto life and godliness everything pertaining to eternal life everything pertaining to abundant life everything pertaining to a happy glad joyful life everything pertaining to an overcoming life everything pertaining to a conquering life he has provided everything for us now what the people of the old covenant could not overcome you will overcome and what the the people of the old covenant what they could not achieve in the lord by the grace of god you can because now those things that have not entered into the ears of man and what men have not seen and what people have not even perceived in their heart everything is now provided unto us and then he tells us in that verse 3 he says it is through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature can you think about that can you think about that that the nature that adam lost because god said let us create man let us make man in our image that nature of God that Adam and Eve lost, he says now, the Lord is restoring that unto you and to me. You will have the nature of God. And that nature of God will operate in a dynamic way in your life in Jesus' name. That as Christ had that nature and it was victorious when he was here on earth, that same nature of God, that same nature of Christ will be imparted unto you. You will be as victorious as he was in Jesus' name. And the nature that knew no defeat, the nature that knew no sin, the nature that Satan could not conquer, the nature that problems could not conquer, he had solution for every problem that arose. His sin is passing that nature onto us. It's a great mistake for you. It's a great mistake for me. It's a great mistake for anyone living on this side of the cross to be thinking about since David could not overcome 
overcome that i cannot overcome you can and since moses did not was not even able to go through this maybe i cannot you can and maybe because solomon could not go through this maybe i cannot you can because we're now living in the new covenant and what they did not have what they did not possess what their eyes did not see what their ears did not hear what did not enter into the heart of any man in the old covenant thank god today it's provided for everyone it will be yours in jesus name whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption having escaped the corruption having escaped the corruption you will escape i said you will escape you see the people in the old covenant and their complaint was the world was so bad the Canaanites around them were so bad. The Amalekites around them were so bad. The influence, the negative influence, the defiling influence, the, sin, the deceitful influence of the people around them was so strong and it swept them up their feet. And now people are saying, you know, if those people could not overcome this, if that those people could not overcome that, how can I today? You understand now? What they didn't see, what they did not observe, and what they did not understand, what did not even enter into their heart is provided for you now. And what they could not escape, you will escape in Jesus' name. And look at that in that verse 4. It says that now we escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Not only that, we're saved now. We can be sanctified now. We can be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost now in a measure that nobody in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, had we can have today. It is yours in Jesus' name. In fact, it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beyond salvation, beyond sanctification, beyond baptism in the Holy Ghost and beyond the gifts of the Spirit and beyond the power you might have tasted or experienced. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. We're not looking at the disgraceful things that other people in other generations did. We're looking at now the glory of the Lord. And it says here that we're beholding as in a glass. The glory of the Lord were changed into the same image. Look at Christ. Look at his nature. Look at his concrete power and look at his victory and look at how he overcame everything and he says now because what the other eyes have not seen and what their ears have not heard and what has not entered into the heart of any of them it says now we're changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord number one the previously unseen preparation of the lord Lord. Number two, the previously unsearchable provision in his love. Number three, the perfectly unspeakable paradise for the Lord. Now come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 9. Chapter 2 verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen, no ears heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Look at verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us. Their ears did not hear, but God has revealed them unto us. 
Their eyes did not see, but God has revealed them unto us. It did not enter into the heart of any of those men and women of old, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The perfectly unspeakable paradise for the Lord. What he has revealed to us now that the other people in the old generation did not have in Second Corinthians chapter 12. We're reading here from verse 2. Second Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 2. It says, Second Corinthians chapter 12. Reading from verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above more than 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew, and I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is unlawful for a man to utter. He said, I saw this man, I knew this man. Actually, he was talking about himself. And he said, he was caught up into heaven. He was caught up into paradise. And he had things he couldn't even tell anybody when he came back from glory. Has that ever happened to anyone in the old covenant? That God will take them to heaven? Well, he took Enoch to heaven, but he come back to continue his ministry. And he took Elijah to heaven. He didn't come back immediately to continue his ministry. And God was telling uh, uh, Paul the apostle, what eyes have not seen, what ears have not heard, and what has not entered into the heart of any man, I will reveal unto you to give you the impetus and to give you the, uh, something that will propel you to continue in the ministry. And he took him to paradise and he said, I saw, and he said, I heard, and he said, I beheld, and I came back here to continue my ministry now, perfectly unspeakable paradise for the Lord ones. Other people were looking forward to that, but they didn't see that directly, but Paul the Apostle was taken to the great beyond to see that, you know, sometimes the devil might be seen, is there heaven? Is there a place of glory? Is there a place of reward? And then you see all these that I'm doing now, what if I finish and there's no heaven? I want to assure you there is heaven. I said I want to assure you there is heaven. What eyes have not seen? What ears have not heard? And what has not entered into the heart of man? What God has prepared and provided for them that love him? You'll be there in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're reading from verse 16. It says in Hebrews 11, verse 16, But now they desire a better country, that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to call to be called their God, and for he has prepared for them a city. What God has prepared for them that love him. You love him? I said, do you love him? 
And do you love him enough to believe him and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn away from your sin and believe on him as your savior, as your sin bearer, as your substitute? This is what he has prepared for them that love him. And it says he has prepared for them a city. I pray you'll be there by and by in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 14. We're reading from verse 2. John chapter 14. We're looking at verse 2. It says in verse 2, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare. Underline the word prepare. What God has prepared for them that love him. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there ye may be also. Where Christ is, that's where you are going. Where the Lord Jesus is now in heaven, that's where you'll be forever and ever in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4, it says, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Where I'm going you know, and the way you know. Let's come back here now to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9 again. 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. How about the people that do, love, that do not love him? As God prepared, anything for the people that do not love him we need to consider this because this is the reason why believers were so eager and were so passionate and we're running because we know god has prepared something for us what others cannot see what others cannot understand, what cannot penetrate into their hearts, we know those things are ours. And because we know they are ours, that's what gives us the drive, that's what gives us the passion, that's why we're running towards that goal of what he has prepared for us. But you know, all those unbelievers, all those sinners, they're in darkness, it has not entered into their mind, they don't know that God has prepared something you know, for the people that do not love him understand them that love him and them there are those who hate him we're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 7 in Deuteronomy chapter 7 I'm reading here from verse 9 verse 9 and then I'll go to verse 10 it says in verse 9 know therefore Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God and the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him. Those are the words, them that love him. He prepares something for us. Salvation available. Sanctification available. Holy Ghost power available. The gifts of the Spirit available. Service unto God available. Every grace, all grace that we need available because we love Him and because we believe in Him. He says them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Look at verse 10. And He repairs them that hate Him. Verse 9. Them that love him. Verse 10, them that hate him. He says, he repairs them that hate him to their face. To destroy them, he will not slack to him that hated him. He will repay him to his face. How would you understand them? What eyes have not seen? What ears have not heard? What has not entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for them 
that hate him. For them that love him not, what has he prepared for them? Those people that do not love the Lord were coming to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're reading from verse 34, and they will go to verse 41. In Matthew chapter 25, look at verse 34 and look at the word prepared, prepared, prepared. It says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 24, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the the kingdom prepared inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world them that love him there's a kingdom them that love him there's a heaven them that love him there's a paradise them that love him there is the heavenly eternal kingdom he has prepared for them that love him how about the people that do not love him how about the people that hate him? How about the people that reject Christ as Savior and they reject his salvation and they do not love his word and they do not love the word to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they carry on in their sin? Look at verse 41. Look at what's prepared for them too. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared that's the word again prepared for the devil and his angels so if you love the lord there are things that are prepared for you if you don't love the Lord, there are things that are prepared for you. If you love the Lord and you believe him and you uh, repent of your sin and you totally surrender your life unto him because of the love you have for him, he has prepared grace, he has prepared gifts, he has prepared his goodness, he has prepared all the provisions of heaven and he has prepared heaven for you. But if you don't love him, the same thing he has also prepared sorrow and sadness and judgment and suffering and calamity and he has prepared hellfire for the people that do not love him i pray you'll make the right choice in jesus name i have made my own choice i said i've made my own choice I choose to love the Lord. I choose to serve the Lord. I choose to believe on the Lord. And I choose to go in the way of the Lord so that those things that have not entered into the heart of man, those things that other people have not seen uh, their mind because I believe. And if you make up your mind and you make your choice and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation will be yours. I didn't hear your amen sanctification will be yours holiness will be yours all the gifts of god will be yours every provision that christ has provided on the cross of calvary will be yours in jesus name and at last when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in christ shall rise and we shall be changed incorruptible we all and we go up to the lord when saints go marching in you'll be among us you'll march in also with us in jesus name i said we'll march in in jesus name I pray that the grace to continue in the Lord and the strength to continue in the Lord and the fortitude and the love to continue in the Lord, the Lord will grant every one of us and we will abide in his love to the very end in Jesus' name. The revelation of God's provision for the believers. Number two now is the realization of God's plenitude by the beloved that's by the lord jesus christ what he provides for us the fullness the completeness of the blessings of god god's plenitude for the beloved the realization let's come back to first corinthians chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 11 first corinthians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 11 for what man knoweth the things of a man, 
except save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god what's he telling us there he's saying only the spirit of god knows what's in god what god has provided and if you're going to know those things that God has provided, you have to have the Spirit of God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, since it is the Spirit of God alone who searches all things, who makes everything visible, who enlightens us, and who shows us what's available in the kingdom of God, He only is the one that is able to reveal that if you are going to know the things that belong to the believer and the things that come through the Lord Jesus Christ, you must have that spirit that will reveal that unto you. It says in verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we might know that's why we receive the spirit that we might know the things that are freely given unto us when we have the spirit of god is a revealer is a guide as a teacher, it's the one that teaches us and guides us into all the provision of God. And he says, it's not the spirit of the world, it's not the spirit of the age, it's not the spirit of man, but the spirit of God himself. And he makes us to know all those things that are freely given to us of God. In verse 13, which things also will speak, not in the words which man's wisdom some teachers but which the Holy Ghost teaches which the Holy Ghost teaches if you only have a human being to teach you then you'll be limited in what you know you'll be limited in what you have you'll be limited in what you possess you'll be limited in your victory but when the Holy Ghost himself the third personality in the Godhead in the Holy Trinity when that Holy Ghost when he brings heavenly things unto you spiritual things unto you and he reveals to you what only he can reveal to any man then you will know what you possess in the lord it says which the holy ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual comparing spiritual things when you read the word of god and then you want to have uh, something spiritual and something high something great from the uh, from the presence of god from the throne of god you compare spiritual things that you have read with the spiritual things you are aiming at you want the lord to grant unto you the realization of god's plenitude by the beloved three things said number one is the comprehension the comprehension number two is the concession the concession number three is the comparison number one the comprehension of spiritual truth by the spirit the comprehension the understanding the enlightenment the knowledge of spiritual things by the spirit it tells us in that verse 11 it says for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit that which is in him What's, what does that mean that saying uh, take yourself for example i cannot know you the, the way you know yourself no matter how we're close no matter how intimate we are, no matter how we even talk together every time, your inner man knows more about you than anybody outside you will ever know. Because your inner man knows your thoughts, knows your motives, knows your plan, knows your background, knows your present, knows your desire, knows your drive, knows everything about you. The spirit of man knows him through and through. It's saying the same thing, that the spirit of God is the one that knows God through and through. And if you're going to know anything of God, that spirit of God must reveal him in totality and in truth 
clothed in entirety and in completeness unto you. Look at that verse 11. See how you understand now for what man knoweth the things of a man save that is except except the spirit which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. The comprehension we have is by the Spirit of God. And the understanding we have is by the Spirit of God. That's why the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, we're reading from verse 26, John chapter 14, reading from verse 26, it tells us about the Spirit, and it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, all things, is the one that knows, is the one that possesses that knowledge, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the future, the knowledge of the past, the knowledge of the present, and the knowledge of the provision of God for you. He says that Spirit of God will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John chapter 16, reading from verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13, how be it when he, the Spirit is come, of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. It's by the resident Spirit of God that we comprehend, that we understand, that we discern the things that are of God. He grants us comprehension. He makes us to understand. He makes us to know. That's the reason why if you just come to the Bible study, or you come to the fellowship, or you come to the worship on Sunday, you hear the word, it gets to your brain, gets to your mind even, and it's on the note that you are writing, but you don't take time to pray, and you don't invite, you don't allow the Spirit of God to reveal those deep things to you, they will lie on the surface of your heart. You will come again, and then it's like water that is thrown at the back of a bowl, and it doesn't really penetrate. It is the Spirit of God that will take that word and make that word penetrate and bring conviction to us, and bring comprehension unto us, and bring understanding unto us, and bring to us what we can have in Christ, and how we can have those things in Christ. That's why it's possible for somebody to hear the word of sanctification and the spirit of God does not take that and, and impact that in the heart of the man and there's no sanctification he might know it in the head it doesn't come into the earth that's why it is possible to hear about victory and about conquering and about overcoming every challenge of life and then we know the theory we know the chapter we know the verse but the Holy Spirit has not come to implant that in our heart and therefore many people are not victorious but today as you allow the Holy Ghost to come because he has a monopoly of the knowledge of the truth and the knowledge of the divine when he comes to you everything you ought to know you will know everything you ought to have you will have everything you ought to possess you will possess you will take time to wait on the Lord and you will take time to pray and allow the Spirit of God to grant you comprehension you'll have comprehension in Jesus name number two is the concession of spiritual treasures unto the saints the concession of spiritual treasures unto the saints. We're coming back to First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, Now we have received 
Paul the Apostle said, I couldn't be an apostle without receiving. We have received. Paul the Apostle said, I couldn't be a preacher. I couldn't be a minister without receiving. We have received. And he said, you Corinthians, you couldn't be believers except to receive. But now we have received. It's not just enough to receive from man or to receive the message from man. You as an individual, as you hear the word of God, you open your heart, you open your mind, and you open your spirit and soul and say, Lord, I know nothing by myself. I receive. It says now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Think about that. Two kinds of spirits. There's the spirit of the world. There is the spirit of God. And those two spirits cannot abide and dwell in the same heart. The spirit of the world and the spirit of God cannot abide and reign in the same heart. What's the spirit of the world? The spirit of the world is the attitude of the world. It brings up the character of the world. It brings up the mode of operation of the people of the world. It brings up the character, the action, the habit of the people of the world. They go by their principles. They go by their proverbs. They go by their society, by you know what they have learned. And it is the spirit of the age. Sometimes it comes out with violence. It's the spirit of the world. Sometimes it comes out with a chameleon kind of attitude. It's the spirit of the world. Sometimes it comes out with unbelief and definite arrogant unbelief. And sometimes it comes out with bull face. This is what I'm going to do. And it's an evil thing. And that spirit of the world anywhere it abides the spirit of god cannot abide there and so to have the spirit of god because without that spirit of god everything that ought to be revealed unto us will not be revealed and so we have to drive out that spirit of the world we have to turn away from that spirit of the world we have to stamp on our feet that spirit of the world we have to throw at our back the spirit of the world and the actions and the habits and the attitude of the people of the world and then the spirit of God will come in and when it comes when the spirit of God comes in there will be light when the spirit of God comes in all the burden all the heavy load is taken away when the spirit of God comes in all the past old action and old habit of the spirit of this age everything is gone and then you come into the plenitude of the provision of the Lord for you I pray he will do that for you I said he will do that for you and then you'll be able to say we or I have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that I might know, that I might know, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. You'll know that the promises are freely given unto you. You will know that the power is freely available for you. You will know that all the provisions of Calvary, that the faith to believe that, a practical faith, a positive faith, a pungent faith, a possessing faith, to have that will be yours because the Spirit will make it easy. It will be on the throne of your heart. He'll say, that's freely given to you. Healing, that's freely given to you. Deliverance, that's freely given to you. Somebody can tell you healing is yours. It doesn't register. The deliverance is yours. It doesn't register. Victory is yours. It doesn't register anybody can tell you we can read it to you in the word of God prosperity is yours it doesn't register but the spirit of the world goes out the spirit of God comes in and then he himself begins to the deep speaks unto the deep the spirit of God speaks unto your own spirit 
this is yours, that is yours, that is yours. In no time at all, you will possess in Jesus' name. I will possess in Jesus' name. And then you walk by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and he gave himself for us. Galatians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, we're reading here from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, which things also were speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, we speak with preachers, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, we speak with soul winners, we harvesters, we evangelists, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. What does that mean? It's not in the words of the people that teach in the secular school, or the people that teach in the community and we don't borrow from the people of the world the orators of the world the singers of the world and the the heroes of the world and this is how they communicate and then we bring that to the church that's the wisdom of the world it will not understand it will not penetrate the hearts of men it says that we apostles and we pastors and we teachers and we evangelists and we prophets and we members of the church and we ministers it says we teach not in the wisdom which the world's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. When the Holy Ghost comes on the throne of the heart and abides on the throne of the heart, all the things you learn, you'll take a story in the Old Testament, spiritual, you'll apply it to the area of your life, spiritual, we take spiritual things and then we contrast, we compare and we teach and we get lessons and we get, uh, you know, enlightenment from those spiritual things to our spiritual lives. Our illustrations, whether to ourselves or whether we're preaching to the church, will not be like, you know, we're taking examples from politics, we're taking examples from society, we're taking examples from occultic world, we're taking examples from the idolatrous world. No, we take the spiritual things of the Bible and we compare with spiritual things in our lives and then we're able to arrive at the truth of the word of God. Anything that happens in your life, anything that comes up in your life, you are able to find something spiritual in the word of God and the spirit of God will take that and apply that to you apply that to your situation and you will have the victory and you must have the victory victory will be yours in jesus name but you know if you don't have the spirit of god and if you don't allow the spirit of god to work in your life and let's say for example there's a situation in situation in your life i cannot understand this how did this happen how did this happen and if all the things that come to your mind are some things in the world some examples in the world and then when i was uh, you know what before i became converted this is how we address such a problem and then you take carnal things to apply to a spiritual situation it will not work and defeat will be there all the time. I pray that today your defeat will be changed to victory in Jesus' name. The comparison of spiritual things with spiritual. Let me just point your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3, it says, And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Paul the apostle was now going to talk to them about something spiritual, about their life 
about their pilgrimage, about their journey in the Lord. And he goes to the Bible, he goes to the Old Testament, and he's going to find something spiritual and bring to apply unto them. And then he says in verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock. Do you, do you see how spiritual, spiritual comes in? Because it's passing a spiritual message across, is taking spiritual uh, stories from the Old Testament and is going to compare that with them and apply that unto them. And it says, For the drag of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these six were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it he brought a spiritual lesson to them by taking something spiritual from the word of god and in romans chapter 15 looking at verse 4 romans chapter 15 verse 4 and whatsoever things were reaching aforetime and those are the spiritual things, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. If our lives are going to be straightened out, if our lives are going to be victorious, if we're going to have the conquering power that others in the scriptures had, we need to take the spiritual things of the word and apply to our lives. It says in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, for whatsoever things were reaching for time, were reaching for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. There's hope for you. There's hope for your family. There's hope for our members. And there's hope for our church in Jesus' name. The realization of God's plenitude, God's fullness, God's abundance and God's provision by the beloved. We'll come to point number three now. The response of God's people to his benevolence. Of all that God has spoken to us today, the things that prepared for his soul, the things that have not, that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, that have not entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for everyone that loves him, and the things that are revealed unto us by the Spirit of God, reminding us it takes the Spirit of God to look into the deep things of God and to reveal unto us, and to know that if we don't have that Spirit of God, we cannot have the fullness of the revelation and of the realization of what God has provided. All that God has revealed to us today, what's going to be the application? What's going to be the response of everyone that I've heard today? That brings us to this, number three, the response of God's people to his benevolence. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. In verse 16, for who has known the might of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the might of Christ. Three things here. Number one, the blindness of the natural man. The blindness of the natural man. He wants to go to the heavenly city. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but he's blind. He cannot see the way. And it's the natural man. And if you're telling him, you know what to do, all you need to do is to look to Calvary. He said, no, the works of my hand. I must do something by myself. 
And when my good works are greater than my bad works, I'll make it by myself. He wants to be his own savior. He's the natural man. He cannot understand the things of God. That's the blindness of the natural man. Look at that verse 14 again. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. Salvation, he says, how can this be? You must be born again. How can that be? Are you a ruler in Israel? And yet you do not know these things. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness unto him. How can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born while I am old now? The natural man does not understand the way of the Spirit, the way of salvation. And then when it says that our depravity can be removed and the Adamic nature can be removed, if the man, even though he's saved, if, he's, if he goes to natural reasoning, uh, how will that be? Will somebody come and take his hand and put in my heart and remove that Adamic nature? He does not understand the spiritual oppression of God that takes that carnal nature away because he does not have and he does not give chance to the Spirit of God to lead him. And then when it says, after you are saved and you are sanctified, you will be praying and you are praying for the Holy Ghost and as you are praying in your normal life, language the spirit of god will come he'll change your language you'll speak in an, another language the canal man will say stop right there you mean what it takes uh, seven years for some people to learn a foreign language i will not go to school i will not learn the grammar i'll just be praying like this and then the holy ghost will come and then he will change my language the canal person the one who oppresses in the natural will not understand understand the things of God. Somebody has a sickness and it's a terrible sickness and we say by his stripes we are healed. That as we look to Calvary, the stripes of Jesus, there's no physical connection. It's just your faith in Christ. As you believe like this, the signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll speak with new tongues and if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. He says, how will I feel? How will it come? Will I see uh, thunder coming? Will I see uh, lightning striking? We say no, that by just believing that that power of Christ will come to you, it will heal every sickness in your body. It will heal every sickness in your body. But a carnal man who is only thinking about it in a carnal way, he cannot understand. Will receive the promises of God and the things of God by the Spirit, the blindness of the natural man. We're looking at Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You find somebody arguing against the word of God, is at enmity with God, is arguing against the way of salvation, is arguing against follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, is arguing against it, shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, is going about with natural boldness, the boldness of a carnal man, natural courage, the courage of a carnal man, and he doesn't understand that the courage and the boldness and the power that comes by the Spirit of God is much, much greater than any natural boldness. It says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject it is not submissive to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh 
cannot please God. I pray that all the blindness of the carnal man, of the natural man, the Lord will take it away from every one of us in Jesus' name. Number two is the blamelessness of, the, of notable maturity. The blamelessness in notable maturity. Come back to First Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 15. But he that is spiritual, in the original, he that is matured, he that is perfect, he that has come of age, he that is spiritual, judges all things. He that is spiritual, that what judge there means, he discerns all things, he deciphers all things, he can understand all things because he's spiritual and because the Spirit of God abides in him. And the Spirit of God that inspired the scriptures abiding in him enlightens him as to the interpretation of the word and the application of the word and the impact of the word word in our lives he is spiritual and therefore he discerns he judges he understands all things yet he himself is judged of no man what does that mean he himself is discerned by no man you cannot discern him you cannot understand him when, he, when you say, now if you are going to have a progress, the way to have progress is brush everybody out of the way and, bu and bulldoze your way through. He says, no, the way I'm going to have uh, progress, I will stay where I am. I will kneel on my, on my knees and then I will pray to God and say, God, I'm not worthy of anything. Even the things I have now, I'm not worthy. And that you even give this to me, I'm grateful to you. And if you want me to have this, oh Lord, open the way and open the door. And I want to get the, and the, the other person cannot understand him. You want to make progress and you are not sharp. You are not uh, kind of, uh, you know, aggressive. And you are not beating everybody out of the way. They cannot understand him because he is spiritual. You know, the people who give all to God and they say I give, I give, I give uh -huh. and they say you're going to become poor because you're always giving, always giving and you're not thinking about saving for the rainy day he has understood the way of faith, he has understood the way of giving, he's a spiritual man and because he lives by the spirit and he lives in the scriptures, his ways are not understood, that's what it means there and no man can judge him and no man can discern him and no man can understand him but the secret of his life is that he's coming to maturity the secret of his life is that he's led by the spirit all the time and then we come to the blessedness of having the new mind the blessedness of having the new mind and look at verse 16 there for who has known the mind of the Lord that he me instruct him while the people come and are trying to correct the almighty they are trying to instruct the almighty the almighty says this is the way walk ye in it they're saying but god how about if i do it this other way the lord is saying go down and go on your knees and be humble and the lord will honor the humble they say you know god the world has changed if we're no more in the world of the bible if you are submissive today if you are humble today they'll walk on you and trample on you and you will never amount to anything you'll be warm all the time they're arguing with god they're trying to instruct God, the way to live and the way to behave, they are redefining sanctification. They are redefining holiness. They are redefining the way of the Lord. But the people that say, I know God is perfect. I know God is right. I know God is the only one that can make me to have everything he wants me to have. And if he says this is the way, the way to do and to make progress is to bend, I'll bend. The way to make 
progress is to kneel i'll kneel in the way to make progress is to be quiet i'll be quiet the way to make progress is to love i will love the way to make progress is to do it this way that way exactly that i will do they are not trying to change god they are not trying to instruct god that's why it says and who has known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of christ it says that's the solution to every problem that you as a child of god you become born again and then you throw away your mind instead of saying i will speak my mind i'm a man of my mind i'm a woman of my mind when i say this is what i will do i want everybody to know that is my mind and that is what will be done heavens may fall the sky may fall this is my mind uh -uh, the mind of Christ Lord not my will but thine be done that's how to have the victory that you come to God and you say God I've been on this road for a long time a man of my own mind a woman of my own mind and I've been so rigid and I've been so concrete and uh, it's just like if it doesn't happen that way I am going even if I see a pillar in front of me and I'm going to knock my head on that pillar I don't care I have my mind you know what the Lord is saying uh, victory doesn't come that way the spiritual life maturity doesn't come that way we have the mind of Christ and I pray that today all that we have heard will be reaching on the tables of our heart you will have the mind of Christ you have the gentleness of Christ. You have the love of Christ. You have the meekness of Christ. You have the lowliness of Christ. You have the humility of Christ in Jesus' name. We're looking in at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a victory. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You claim salvation. Let this mind be in you. The lowliness of Christ, the humility of Christ, the meekness of Christ, the surrenderedness of Christ, the submission of Christ, not my will, then be done. Let the might of Christ be in you. And Paul the Apostle said, It's possible. We have the might of Christ. You will have the mind of Christ. Who am I talking to tonight? You'll have the mind of Christ in Jesus. Let's rise up now. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't just pray, don't just pray. Everything we have heard will bring that to the Lord in prayer. The revelation of God's provision for believers. What ears have not heard, what eyes have not seen, what has not appeared, and what has not penetrated into the heart of any man. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. But the Spirit has revealed them to us. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord until the might of Christ is implanted unto you. <laughs> 